Uh, thanks. Uh, my name is Yuri Benesh, and I work as a tech lead in uh, Kiwi.com. And I would like to tell you a few words about uh, this topic. Well, the problem is that over years, uh, the systems are g getting uh, more and more complex. We develop more complicated systems. We have uh, like uh, uh, higher uh, requirements for the systems to uh, have like uh, more complicated features, more of features. And uh, especially in the past years, we are trying to usually break up like big monolithic applications into smaller chunks. So the apps like have a lot of more uh, dependencies and uh, uh, are like getting more complex in uh, general. And the problem is that usually like anything can uh, break down. Any of your dependencies like uh, network can, down, can go down, uh, any data center and uh, whatever. Like anybody can do some uh, human mistake and uh, the system just can uh, crash down. Like, for example, in past two months, you may have noticed that one credit card scheme had like big outage in Europe and a lot of people couldn't pay with credit cards. And two weeks later, it happened to a different credit card company. And a uh, few weeks after that, there was like a huge storm in Germany that caused like outage of one of big uh, data centers. And this company has like, uh, like uh, really big budgets and they are doing the best to uh, stay like available, but anything can happen and they uh, can just uh, break down. So goal of this talk is like to present few techniques uh, that can help preventing of uh, failing your app in case line, uh, of the dependency will fail. Uh, we will see some examples in Python and uh, the other goal is to have actually visibility over your app to know what exactly is happening inside not just to deploy some app somewhere and uh, not to, to know what is happening there. For example, in uh, uh, my previous company, uh, we have been using one of the data center. Uh, they were like more expensive, that, uh, but they promised like 100% uh, reliability. And uh, so we paid something extra to have something uh, reliable. But what happened once, uh, suddenly all of our apps running there just went down. So we called them and asking uh, when they're gonna fix it. They were asking fix what? We explained the servers. They asked uh, which ones. We told them like all of them. They didn't believe us. So we advised go to your web, not even this is running. And they realized that they have a problem. And what happened? They found out that some maintainer, some plumber, actually uh, broke a pipe uh, in the building and the uh, whole data center was flooded. So they were like uh, repairing the infrastructure over six days, uh, loading the backups, and they didn't even know like uh, that something actually happened. They claimed to have like 100% uh, reliability, that they have backups, when, but the backups were in the same building. <laughs> so uh, basically, you can't like trust uh, anybody and uh, you should know what is happening uh, with your infrastructure. So uh, we'll go through some techniques uh, that you can apply in Python to uh, make your uh, app more stable. We'll go through some uh, monitoring and alerting and uh, later uh, uh, some tips what you can like uh, aim on when you are deployed, deploying the infrastructure, out testing, etc. So uh, when you start actually uh, developing the app, uh, you should think of uh, what uh, about what are you actually using in your app. Like uh, if you have some third party APIs, databases, Redis, uh, Redises, what servers you use, where they are and, um, and whatever. And uh, you should realize the importance uh, of your uh, resources. Like this database, is it okay if it goes down for one minute? What happens if it goes down for one hour? Do they have uh, any SLAs? Like, can you trust them? Do you have backups in more different locations? How do you use these resources? Like, how often? Uh, like, uh, when you're starting, like, building, for example, some Django app, it has only one database. But over time, like over years, there will be more and more people working on that. And uh, suddenly you will have like dozens of dependencies, a lot of databases, third party APAs, and it can easily turn uh, into a mess. Like, uh, I don't think that uh, they originally designed it like this, but 
somehow it can naturally uh, happen that you are like uh, with uh, big spaghetti infrastructure. In one of the previous companies, again, uh, there was like some time period where DevOps uh, usually once a week found a server and nobody knew what is like, uh, what is running there and what is that we even had it. So uh, when you know that, uh, what are you uh, actually using? Next thing is like, uh, uh, to think about how you use it. Let's say we have uh, some service and we have some dependency, which can be some uh, REST API. Now we see like healthy communication. Uh, we have a request on time, we send a request, uh, receive a response immediately and everything is smooth. But the problem uh, becomes when the dependency is starting uh, timeouting you have like uh, some delay when you get the response and uh, your requests are uh, starting piling up and uh, being handled in parallel. Yeah, so uh, uh, what are the consequences? Like your users of your uh, service will have like a slower response. Uh, another thing is that your app will start like eating uh, resources. For example, if you don't have, if you have some Python app which is not uh, like uh, fully async, you may have depleted your application uh, workers, and uh, that will be like busy waiting uh, and looking at other resources, and it may end up that new requests that your app will started receiving, you will just throw them away because you won't have uh, anything to handle them. Uh, so, what can you do? Uh, check out like uh, any communication with uh, other systems and decide like uh, how long is worth to waiting uh, for the response. Yeah, uh, let's say we have, uh, for example, some eShop and in the corner you have information about uh, the weather in Edinburgh, which is like uh, nice to know, but uh, it's not worth for a user to wait one minute to load eShop to see like this information. Let's say that uh, the weather API like uh, timeouting, so we'll just cut the request, for example, after one second or three seconds, and just don't show the user the information. Uh, most of the like uh, Python uh, uh, libraries uh, usually have parameter timeout, which we, uh, which uh, which with what we can set the number of seconds you want to actually wait for the response and otherwise cut the request. So when you apply it, the communication can look like this. Even though the dependency is starting piling up the request, uh, you are uh, returning the response on time, but uh, you will lose the information, you don't have the response. A uh, few things to, uh, to be aware of, like uh, if you cut a request that actually uh, manipulates uh, with uh, some data, for example, storing uh, in database, and you cut it off, it may be like uh, executed anyway. So you may uh, store something in database or may play with data and you don't know if you did it or not. And uh, second thing, like if you have some Python uh, component, for example, that uh, handles the work with Redis, you need to take care of if you uh, set timeout, uh, not just to querying the result from Redis or database, or also for initialization of communication because some of the libraries allows you to set your only timeout for uh, the query itself. So even though that you set up the timeouts, you might end up like uh, breaking your app because you didn't, or the, applica the, uh, the library doesn't allow to set it properly. This is like a really basic technique that should be, in my opinion, uh, applied to any communication. And uh, one more like uh, advanced technique is uh, applying circuit breakers. Uh, the philosophy behind it is like uh, when you have some dependency that starts failing, uh, uh, why should you communicate uh, with it? For example, uh, you have this uh, eShop with uh, weather information. If several users uh, uh, will end up with error loading the weather, you will just stop uh, displaying it at all and users won't get the information at all. Uh, so. If you know the dependency fails, you won't uh, even wait for any timeouts or any seconds. You will just immediately uh, return instant errors. So you won't uh, pile any request or anything. And also it's better for third-party system recovery. 
let's say that the uh, other system is failing because it's overloaded. So if you actually stop calling it, you may give it a time uh, to uh, auto-recover. Uh, in Python, uh, there are some libraries uh, usually implemented as a decorator. You will just set up decorator. You will specify how many errors in a row you will allow uh, for this resource and uh, some uh, interval how long you will wait uh, until you try to communicate with uh, it again. You will apply the creator for a function. In case the function will uh, raise errors like five times in a row, you will stop using the function. The creator will stop calling the function for 60 seconds in this example. Mm, how it works inside? Uh, the uh, breaker has three saves. One is closed, which means the communication is OK, everything is smooth, and you call the dependency um, uh, normally as you should. Second state is open, which means uh, something is uh, wrong, and you stop calling the dependency at all. And half open is a state uh, when you were open, and uh, you are trying to query, uh, you just try to send out a few queries, a few requests, and you will see. Uh, if it's healthy or not. And uh, based on that, you will decide if you wait for or close the breaker. So communication can look like this. Uh, you have first request that uh, gives you like uh, 100 or 200 or some uh, success response, so breaker is closed. Second request is still okay, so you are keeping closed. Third request, you will get some error or timeout or mm, uh, just some error response. But you will check that it's only first error, so you will keep uh, the breaker closed. Then you will receive another request, uh, another error, and you will see, ah, it's already like uh, end uh, error, so I will open the breaker. Then uh, there will be like this communication window that you will stop calling uh, uh, the dependency, and after that you will try to you will get to half open state and try to send her some request. If you are okay, you will close it and uh, continue or uh, add some uh, time window again. So the communication uh, looks like this. Once you start uh, receiving errors or uh, timeouts, you will just stop communicating with it. So in general, like you will uh, return instant errors and you won't deplete uh, any resources and you will give a time to recover for the system. And yeah, uh, to Python implementations. Yeah. Uh, so far, uh, we have been using uh, breakers and timeouts just to kill some uh, uh, dependency that uh, is malformed. But in case you have uh, something really critical uh, to perform, some action, for example, in a shop, if you are like uh, uh, handling the payment or something, in case like uh, the other system, for example, payment gateway will start failing, you may really want the response, so you will duplicate the request uh, again till you get the response. So uh, from this uh, perspective, uh, handling your request will take longer because you are internally calling the service uh, more times, but you will get your uh, response. Uh, again, implementations, uh, it can be made as a decorator. You will just uh, set up like how many times you want to uh, repeat the request. It shouldn't be like uh, infinite time or whatever. Uh, you can specify how long you will wait between the requests. Uh, probably you can set up also some jitter or something applied to function. If functions uh, throws an exception, function will be called again and uh, again how you configure it. But uh, there are also problems with it. Uh, first thing is if you actually calling uh, some API like uh, more times, you might end up like uh, changing data uh, more times. You can uh, store uh, like some object to database more times if it's actually internally uh, executed. And uh, be also a big problem is when you are style piling uh, uh, repeaters, either in your application internally on several uh, logical levels or uh, through some other dependency, you may end up like uh, smashing uh, some resource. 
Yeah, uh, here we have like uh, one request to uh, our service, but we will make free request to some dependency. Some dependency will make again free request to other dependency, and in general, from one request, you may end up with uh, nine requests. So uh, this is uh, really dangerous in case the final dependency will start failing because, uh, for example, it's overloaded. And with this me mechanism, you can like totally smash it. Uh, how to prevent it? Uh, for example, uh, your API or the dependencies could return specific error codes, which can tell you, OK, I'm overloaded. Don't repeat the uh, request at all. Uh, uh, it won't help. Or OK, uh, I have some different kind of error. Uh, you can repeat the request, and we will see how it goes. You can also set up uh, some uh, budgets. Uh, let's say that you will allow um, to some dependency uh, repeat calls like 10 times in a minute. So if you repeat it 10 times in first 10 seconds, you will just stop repeating it and give it like more time to recover. Or you can uh, set up some hidden potency uh, mechanism, for example, you will get to your request uh, header information which will tell the dependency that it's a duplicated request and the app can like, uh, handle it properly. It can help, for example, when you are manipulating with data, you will see that you are sending the same request that uh, already, for example, have been handled somehow, so we will just uh, return some error that is already uh, resolved. Yeah, and um, uh, quick thing also, uh, if you don't have to do anything like synchronously. For example, again, eShop, you are uh, receiving orders. You want to see some confirmation email or something. You can just uh, put the request to some uh, queue, schedule some task, which will be uh, handled async, and uh, the system will go like faster, smoother, because it doesn't have to perform the action uh, uh, synchronously. Also, what is important, on the other hand, not to overcomplicate the system, like to apply uh, several of these mechanisms on several layers. You may end up uh, that some layer will swallow like a part of the traceback, or uh, the, some exception may not bubble up uh, for some reason. So you may have like uh, hidden errors or have partial information or you can receive some error more times if you don't handle it properly. Uh, okay, and uh, one more technique. Uh, uh, in our company, uh, we have developed, and, uh, developed uh, some system of diagnostics or repairs, how we call it. And it's in case that you have some uh, communication that you actually want to do uh, as, uh, synchronously, some um, information you, you need, but uh, in case it happens, it's like okay-ish to do it uh, asynchronously after a few minutes. So we have some uh, system that periodically checks this uh, system for inconsistencies, and based on that, it will automatically fix them. For example, you are calling some dependencies synchronously. It will start timeouting, so you can have some uh, side job that will actually pull the system for, uh, for the results of those uh, actions and uh, uh, handle the information properly in the system. It also helped us a few times with some uh, uh, buggy releases. We have released some bug, but the system like uh, discovered uh, some inconsistencies, automatically fixed it. So we actually saw the errors, so we could handle it, and there was like uh, no damage done because uh, the system auto-healed. Ah, yeah. So uh, when we uh, know what dependencies we have and how to handle them, it's also uh, really important to uh, monitor it. Uh, I was working once in a company, and uh, we have developed some eShop. And once somebody contacted us that uh, we are selling uh, something really cheap. So uh, we were like from the start uh, happy that, yeah, uh, we are uh, uh, above our concurrence, but then uh, we dig out that we're already selling it too cheap, and we found out that uh, there was some service calling the currency rates from a bank 
but uh, it got broken in some time and the currency rates were not updated uh, for a few weeks. And there was in one country like bad political situation and the currency rates uh, changed a little bit. So we were selling it like uh, cheaper, like under price uh, uh, in some market. So uh, it was a little bit painful at the time. Uh, so uh, it's important to know uh, what is actually happening in your system. Let's say you have a system that has like a dozen of dependencies, something crashes down, and you have to uh, go to the system and see what is happening, what exactly went down. So you can monitor like all of these uh, resources, measure responses times, uh, the errors it returns, uh, connection counts, throughput writes. With uh, SQL uh, queries, you can go uh, deeper, uh, debug like slow queries in uh, Postgre. If you don't know the explain command, uh, you should definitely check it, which can give you like uh, uh, details about execution plans of uh, your SQL queries. You may find out that there is like something really inefficient and under a little bit heavy load, it can actually like smash your database, uh, deplete CPU or whatever. Uh, you can install in your Python app uh, some uh, APA, APM, that will like uh, for a really small uh, work give you a really nice overview of what is happening in your app. Uh, you have like dashboards or some alerting by default uh, about uh, accounts your API is uh, doing over a database or Redis or whatever, and it can give you like great insight into your application, and you will usually be surprised what is happening inside and how can you like uh, uh, debug it. Next level of uh, monitoring is uh, define some uh, ping endpoint. Also a uh, really simple thing. You'll actually use some third party service that will periodically check if your application is alive. So it's good that it's not like part of your infrastructure. This is something that could do uh, the guys from the, uh, the first story. And uh, when you are doing the ping endpoint, you should also define what does it even mean that uh, your application is healthy? So the ping endpoint could uh, query database, Redis, or check some other dependencies to tell that your application is actually alive, not just returning some dummy responses. The next level of monitoring is, uh, let's say that your application uh, uh, is okay, but uh, you can go a little bit farther. For example, you may uh, monitor the functionality, not just that your API call is healthy, but something that was supposed to be happened actually happened. For example, if you process order, you will send some statistics. Uh, okay, we have uh, somebody purchased a TV uh, in Germany and uh, send the statistics uh, somewhere. It will not tell you the reason in case you are stop selling uh, televisions, like what exactly happened, but you will have some uh, impulse that will give you, that you will be given to check uh, uh, f for some issues. Let's say your application is like 100% okay, but some firewall or uh, something can like block the traffic or you can see that uh, some data center just went down and you were uh, cut off the traffic or something. Oh yeah. What uh, happened for example in uh, our company uh, uh, we were selling, we are selling uh, the fly tickets and uh, one evening uh, we, were, we had this monitoring and uh, uh, we've been alerted uh, like we are selling maybe uh, too much of the tickets. So we were investigating it for hours, we couldn't find anything and uh, we were selling more and more and we couldn't see the reason. But what actually happened? Uh, one bank in, uh, I think it was in uh, Indonesia, they were charging, actually the bank was charging customer only 1% uh, uh, of the price. So we had information, uh, correct information about pricing, 
but somewhere uh, the bank had uh, some buggy release and actually starting uh, charging uh, customer less. So everyone started bu buying this product and we couldn't find uh, like uh, the reason in time. But if we didn't have this monitoring, like uh, the damage could be like uh, much bigger because the banks eventually charged the customer and uh, we handled uh, the refund process. Also, when you have a set of these metrics, we currently in company have like hundreds of uh, such metrics. So we have a team of analytics that are uh, actually uh, building uh, some apps on top of it for detecting some anomalies, which can uh, give you like some impulse or insight that uh, something is uh, actually getting wrong. And if anything uh, from this helps, there is usually something that will report you the uh, error. Uh, so when you have uh, everything, every dependency uh, checked, when you send uh, information about it, like uh, if you have a monitoring setup, the uh, next step is actually uh, set up proper alerting. It's nice to know that uh, somewhere you have information that Redis is timeouting, but uh, you should uh, be alerted to actually be able to take an action. So uh, if, you, if you have uh, any monitors, you can set up proper alerting. You can set up uh, responsible people for the alerts. For each of those, like uh, check the appropriate uh, channel for the alert. If uh, it's something like uh, uh, really important, uh, set up a pager or some phone call. Also, escalation policies in case like somebody is not able to uh, respond uh, uh, to this alert. Uh, also, uh, the really basic stuff. You probably all of you know roll bar or sentry or some uh, error reporting tool. Which will just basically wrap your. Python application and report the errors to some system. And based on that, you can be alerted again. Uh, yeah. So when you have monitoring and uh, proper alerting, next step is uh, to check out if you have uh, proper logging. Let's say you are alerted but you should be all the time be able to, to get uh, details what is actually happening in your app. If you are uh, handling communication with uh, the resources above uh, that we already went through, you should think, okay, what happens if uh, communication with this API falls? Will I have some uh, information to get the de details like instantly uh, or not? So uh, everything should be like uh, logged properly in case it makes sense. In uh, one of the companies we've been building, for example, uh, uh, CRM, and uh, one of the colleagues was working on uh, the core, and there was like a really core database table, and he made, uh, he was using primary key as uh, count of the entries plus one. So he didn't use some sequence or auto increment, and it was like working well till somebody uh, removed the user from the database and cascade delete like deleted a bunch of records, and there was like a huge mess in a database. So the first thing uh, when we noticed what we want to do was uh, to restore a backup of database. We couldn't do that because uh, our uh, server provider had some outage and they didn't store our backups for a week or two. So we spent several days of parsing syslogs and reconstructing the database from it, which was like a really <laughs> hell thing to do. We didn't have like that good logging to do it like a better way, but at least we had something because otherwise we would be uh, really screwed up. Yeah, so proper logging uh, will make your debugging like uh, much easier. You may consider storing uh, importation, important uh, info in database to get like better statistics over it, like get uh, more into detail. Or also, uh, 
uh, consider adding request ID uh, to your logs so you can bulk together uh, logs from more different uh, layers of the logging. Uh, so, um, next step, if you have everything uh, handled properly in, uh, with your Python app, with your infrastructure, is that uh, you need to put it somewhere. So it's usually about uh, the price or laziness uh, and the features provided. You can go with your own servers. Uh, you can uh, use some uh, hosting or cloud services and recently uh, becoming more popular some serverless solutions. For example, on AWS Lambda, you can deploy like Hello World app just writing these two lines and defining uh, API endpoint in uh, Sangui and everything is handled for you. Auto scaling and uh, servers and uh, basically everything you need. Just two lines of code, which is like pretty convenient for some smaller services. Okay, um, also consider auto scaling. Uh, what happens that the load of your application uh, like uh, grows a little bit, like your CPU or something is getting depleted. Usually in cloud services you can set up an auto scaling policy to boot up more servers or containers. Uh, also consider like if one of the servers uh, goes down, what will happen? You can auto restore them, uh, boot up some uh, other servers, uh, for example, in different data center. Uh, a few things that you can do for helping uh, reliability of your app, uh, you can do also on web server. For example, set also a repeater on uh, Nginx level. Uh, so if uh, your request will fail, it will be automatically repeated and you don't have to touch anything in your app. Set up caching to uh, help with the load. Uh, you can uh, proceed with web application firewall that will give you like uh, more features that can uh, like uh, uh, make your app a little bit more stable and you don't have to care uh, about something on uh, app level. Also, when you're developing, uh, you may consider like uh, separated environments for development, stage, production, testing. Also, you have uh, more layers of uh, testing. Uh, you can put your continuous integration, smoke test, uh, integration test, unit test. You can try to send uh, how, some part uh, of the traffic uh, to uh, some canary instance that will be basically a release candidate. So in case you are like uh, not 100% sure that uh, the new release will be okay, you can test it in, uh, partially in some uh, part of the traffic. You can apply the performance tests. Also when it comes to monitoring, uh, so far we've been talking just about application itself, but you need to also monitor the infrastructure itself. Ooh, yeah. Uh, what can you also do with monitoring? For example, uh, set up monitors on top of uh, Nginx. You can be alerted uh, when you receive like a bunch of non-100, uh, 200 uh, requests in a row. Uh, you have uh, logs on a web server, so you can define, again, a request ID populated to your app to join uh, all the logs uh, together on a more different uh, levels uh, of logging. Uh, on runtime, what uh, companies, uh, bigger companies do, actually simulates the outage. You can turn off uh, some of the data center or simulate uh, that some dependency is down and see uh, how actually uh, your app uh, is uh, behaving. Uh, if you uh, do anything for uh, preventing and your, your app uh, will actually have some outage, uh, it's usually the good uh, practice to write uh, post-mortem after everything is resolved to actually uh, get some log uh, about what actually happened so you can learn from your uh, files. You will think deeply about what was actually happened. You can apply uh, the 
fixes uh, for the current outage uh, to other parts of the system because it can be vulnerable also uh, to some issue. And uh, yeah, the key is like uh, to keep track and get uh, into a real cause uh, of uh, the problems. Uh, so we went through uh, some techniques, uh, how to prevent failing that can be applied on uh, different levels uh, of your application. Uh, mainly in, uh, you can do in Python code, like timeouts, breakers, repeaters. And uh, yeah, we've been, we went through uh, monitoring. Uh, you should know like uh, what you are actually using, uh, monitor your servers, application from outside, uh, from different level of your application. You can use APMs and some custom functionality monitoring and uh, play with it more deeply. Uh, we have like a lot of different ways to test that your application is actually stable. Uh, you should think of architecture. Uh, there is like a lot of you can do uh, about reliability or more different uh, levels of your stack. Uh, also, which is uh, really important, do proper logging. Again, you can apply it on more different la layers and uh, join them together to have a really good uh, overview what is happening inside, not just to randomly attach your application when uh, there is some outage. And uh, based on that, also proper uh, alerting. Think of uh, all the use cases uh, for the alerts you set up. If you know what you actually do with alert, uh, you will receive uh, in advance how, uh, how to reach somebody who can uh, handle it. And uh, I think it went a little bit faster than, than I expected. So uh, if you have some questions. OK, so anyone? Thank you. Thank you. So anyone having questions, please come to the microphones. By the way, one uh, also important thing, uh, our company uh, is uh, hosting a party tomorrow in a pub nearby. So if you want to get free drinks or hang with people, uh, you can stop by a Kivicom booth and uh, get some details of where it is. Thank you. Just a second. Hi, thanks for the uh, thanks for the talk. Um, thanks. How do you know that your mon monitoring system works? Uh, <laughs> uh, you monitor it, I suppose. Oh huh? uh, yeah. Uh, usually, we have like uh, more different uh, levels of uh, uh, of uh, monitoring. So uh, when we are thinking about uh, the uh, pinging of your application, and I think that all of them would have to go down at the same time, uh, which is like the probability is really slow because it's usually uh, some, uh, for example, some uh, our self-hosted services or more different uh, third parties uh, with different uh, uh, data centers or whatsoever. Mm, yeah. Yeah, it's often uh, also about the consequences of not working with your app. Yeah, so it's like in more different levels. Thanks. Uh, you mentioned the serverless um, there. Uh, do you have any uh, kind of, for example, AWS? Uh, do you have any kind of like metric on how many? Um, servers would be needed uh, for, to get the same thing running for, for in comparison to on server, for example, Lambda on serverless. Uh, so, sorry, I, I don't have, like, um, I was just recently starting playing with it, so uh, I don't have, like, any, like, deep uh, insights to help you with this uh, request. Okay. But um, maybe we can, uh, if you want, we can talk uh, after the talk, and I can uh, ask some colleagues that have, like, uh, deep experiences with it. Cool, thanks.
Well, before doing Python, I have worked uh, 28 years in a bank, uh, in IT. Mm -hmm. uh, when you have a, a real incident, I see there the, 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 the combination channels. When you have a real incident, you mm -hmm. really want to have a human in charge. So uh, I would suggest that as long as you have not talked with a human, you're not sure that the, the alert has been taken into account, especially when you're in escalation. Mm -hmm. oh, so, yeah. so uh, well, as uh, my experience is that if there's no phone call, you're not sure that somebody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like uh, usually it probably depends how important the alert is and what is the response time you need. If it's something like ASAP, like uh, definitely go with a phone call or anything. Sometimes it's okay just to uh, alert on some uh, secondary system and it's okay if it's handled like in 30 minutes because it's not becoming critical yet. But uh, I agree, like definitely if it's critical, just go with phone and alert anybody you can and do the best to reach the appropriate people. Hi, uh, I've got a question about uh, mapping out dependencies because documentation is all great, but do you have any automated tools that will allow you to like make a graph of dependencies with some calculations and so on? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit tricky. Currently, I think uh, some of our teams like uh, working uh, with uh, cloud formation and stuff like this, like to get uh, all of this uh, together to one place. But uh, I think that uh, there is some solution being developed that could be like potentially uh, open source, but uh, it's definitely not in the stage that uh, we could provide anything. And I don't know about anything like that could like uh, uh, help with this. It's a little bit tricky. Often, if you have like uh, services on more different uh, 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 hostings. Thank you very much for everyone. Okay, thanks.